around. Today we have one of our senior residents, Jesse Abrams, is going to present her grand and The topic she picked was compliance. Let's talk compliance. And so I think this is this is an important area as well, since uh, compliance has a lot to do with what we do every day. So that's it. Thank you. All right. So I'm Jesse. Um, we'll start with some objectives. So by the end of this, you should be able to define compliance, which I'm sure most of you can already do that. Um, discuss the types of non-compliance, importance of compliance as it relates to healthcare. Um, discuss a lot of the factors that contribute to non-compliance, and then the relevance in pediatrics and our role as pediatricians to increase compliance. And then we also discuss strategies to how we can improve our patient compliance. I have no disclosures. And this was an interesting topic to me because I remember in medical school when I went through my family medicine rotations and medicine rotations, it was always a frustrating thing that you see these people who are on hypertension medications, cholesterol, diabetes, that it's like a continuous cycle of noncompliance and you see the effects of it, the complications of it. And then I was like, oh, pediatrics doesn't have this. And for some reason I was like, that, you're always compliant in peds. Parents always give their kids medications. And then I started residency, and I realized it wasn't. There's just as much non-compliance in peds, and it's something that we're always frustrated with every day in clinic. Um, and I was talking to Dr. Rice about this. Most of the PQ admissions, I would say, that's non-trauma and not nuanced, nine out of 10 of them are due to non-compliance. Your status asthmatic is, your status epileptic is, DKAs, it's a huge factor. So let's go with the definition. So compliance, um, the Oxford Dictionary definition is the practice of obeying rules or requests made by people in authority. As it relates to healthcare, it's the patient's behavior, such as taking medications, following the diets, regimens, executing lifestyle changes that coincide with healthcare provider's recommendation. Um, and then adherence is another interchangeable term for compliance, and that's the ability and willingness to abide by a prescribed therapeutic regimen. Um, it suggested that compliance is more along where a prescriber is giving directions and the patient just passively obeys them, whereas adherence more has um, that the patient and the prescriber is in a therapeutic relationship and coming up with the plan together. Concordance is a newer term that's out that's past the patient as a decision maker. If only we could all have our patients take an oath that they'll follow everything that we say. So non-compliance examples, they include not filling prescriptions. A study done showed that per every 100 scripts written, only 50 to 70 of them are filled, and then out of those, only 48 to 66 are picked up, and then out of those, only 25 to 30 are taken appropriately, and then 15 to 20 are refilled. So the compliance is only about 15 to 30 percent at best for every 100 scripts written. It also includes incorrect dose or incorrect timing, changing the frequency of dosing on their own, stopping treatment too soon, delay in seeking health care that causes more complications and makes the outcome worse, not participating in health care visits, we get that a lot where the parents are just on their cell phones and you're just talking, not being interested in participating in the care at all. There's also the white coat compliance where they'll take their medications in the two weeks leading up to the visit and they're like, oh yeah, of course, I've been taking it every day, but not before that. And then they'll do drug holidays on their own, where if they're going away for a week, they won't take their medication, or if they have a camp that they're going to, they'll just skip their medicine. Um, and then just in general, failure to follow instructions. So why is this important? It has a great effect on therapy outcomes um, and direct consequences. We've all seen the effect of it in diabetes, epilepsy, um, tuberculosis, asthma, hypertension, AIDS, all of that. There's also the indirect effect, that's um, loss of productivity. The more time you spend in hospital, the less time you're in school, the less time you're in work. Um, quality of life, as the complications get worse, your quality of life decreases. And in, as far as infectious diseases, it increases the resistance of organisms, but then you're also a risk to others. As we can see, Louisiana with syphilis and all our STDs, you are increasing um, being a risk to others also, and then with all our moms who are non compliant with medications being passed on to babies, and we see that a lot in the nursery and the NICU. Um, non adherence is, um, contributes to 30 to 50% of treatment failures. 
It's also a huge financial burden on society. Um, it leads to excess, excess urgent care visits, hospitalizations. 33 to 69% of hospitalizations are due to noncompliance each year and then higher cost of treatments. It was estimated in 2001 that 13 billion was spent annually due to noncompliance in hospitalizations, urgent care, treatments, all that. And noncompliance alone contributes to 125,000 deaths each year. And that was about 10 years ago, and I don't think it has gotten any better. <clears throat> so factors applying, um, affecting compliance. These factors, there's a lot of literature out there on noncompliance and what causes and what we can do to it. A lot of them pretty much agree on the same things, and then these factors are broken up into different categories. There's the patient factors, which include the demographics, um, age. A study was done where it was found that older patients were more compliant compared to younger. I mean, this did not include pediatrics. The younger was the 30s to 40s age, and then 40s to 55 was the middle age, and then 60 and up would be the older. And the, the older generation were the ones that were non-compliant. But within that study, it was there's the dementia and Alzheimer's factor, the cognition that limits their compliance, or the polypharmacy that you see with the older people that they mix up their medications or don't know the timing. But the willingness to be compliant is there, whereas the younger people, they have more priorities in <coughs> healthcare and medications, and they don't see this as a problem that they need to do right then. Ethnicity, gender, education, marital status are all factors. Caucasians are were found to be more compliant than minorities. Part of that is the language barrier biases that exist within the healthcare system. Um, education, surprisingly, higher education is not relate, equal to higher compliance. It is more lower educated people that are more likely to listen to their physician's advice and take it. Um, and marriage is a factor of non-compliance. Married people are more compliant than single. Psychosocial is also involved, whereas the patients own beliefs, motivation, attitude to be a part of the therapy, believe in the therapy, believe that they have a need for the therapy. And the biggest thing that they, everything says is the relationship between the patient and the prescriber is a huge factor in compliance. The patient's knowledge, health literacy, that's something that we deal with. We can give out all the information, but then you also have to take into consideration what their health literacy is, what they understand their illness to be, if just because we think it's serious doesn't mean they understand it to be serious and they might not be facing the consequences of it right then so they can foresee what, it, what can happen in the future. Substance abuse is a factor in noncompliance, physical limitations, mental limitations, disease factor. Um, then the therapy related factors. This is one of the big ones that we can play a part in and think about. The route of medication, um, PO medication versus inhaled, Oral is found to be the simplest, and then the complexity of the regimen. You know, if you, I found seizure medications with tapering dosage instructions that barely I've ever seen anybody do it correctly, where you know, you're starting off at 15 milligrams in the morning and afternoon, then two weeks later you're supposed to go to 20 in the afternoon, 15 in the morning, patients mix it up, they don't, they're not following the regimen. Um, duration of treatment, it's found that shorter duration is more compliant versus long-term treatments. The side effect profile, that's something that we need to think about, that side effects alone will make patients not want to follow it. Um, the taste of medication, that's a big thing in peds, and as a mom, <laughs> I've realized that. And you can get medications to be flavored, so that's something that you have to think about as a prescriber, that you can tell them you can get it flavored in peds, the taste of medication can um, cause non-compliance. Drug storage, you have to know whether what you're prescribing needs to be refrigerated, um, if it can stay at room temperature, if it needs to be in the dark, in the light, and sometimes the patient that you're prescribing it to may not have a refrigerator, may not have a temperature available that is ideal for that medication. Um, and then the behavioral change that's required in order to be taking the medication. As far as the other two factors, the healthcare system and social and economic, the healthcare system includes the accessibility, how easy it is to get to you, the waiting period, that's a big one. The, the longer you wait, longer wait times mean you don't want to go back and spend that much time waiting for a prescriber or a doctor. And um, the delay in getting scripts filled, satisfaction with the visits. If you're not satisfied with the visit, you're less likely to go back regardless of the problem. And the cost versus income of the patient, the time that's required to take off from work, and their social support. 
the more family support that they have, the more parental support, whether it's a medication regimen or a diet, lifestyle change, that if the whole family is in it, it's more likely that they're going to be compliant than you know, you have a kid that's trying to diet, but the rest of the family is eating McDonald's or you just have sodas available, that makes it more difficult. It's just a diagram of where the three aspects where it can go wrong and how it can is interchanged, like the patient to provider communication. The patient has a poor understanding of the disease or the benefits and risk of treatment. Um, they don't understand the proper use of the medication or it's too complex. Between the provider and the healthcare system, the physician may not know the drug cost, um, is not aware of the insurance coverage of different formularies. That's something we run into. We have a lot of different Medicares, and some cover some stuff, some doesn't cover other. And we might prescribe something that we're used to, but the patient goes to pick it up, and it's not covered. They don't call us back and tell us it's not covered. They just don't take it. Um, and then just to, if the physician is sat not satisfied with their, what they're doing, that's going to reflect on how they treat their patients. And then between the patient and the healthcare system, poor access, that's something that we deal with also. Um, missed clinic appointments, poor treatment by the clinic staff, access to medications, formularies being switched. Um, if the patient doesn't have a way to get to the pharmacy, when we refill, uh, and the high cost of medications. I have um, come across things where all of a sudden their insurance doesn't cover it, and they had to go there and it costs $40. They just won't pick it up. They're not going to pay for it. And you don't realize if it's, even if it's amoxicillin, it might be an antibiotic, it might be a seizure medication, birth control, that you are not aware. You think you prescribed it and they're taking it, but they come back and they're like, oh, I had to pay, so I just didn't take it. So we can identify those at risk for noncompliance. The interventions that are, they require time, energy, expense. So if you can target, the people that are more likely to be non-compliant, you can focus on them more. So some of the factors with non-compliance are previous history of non-compliance, whether if they think the illness or the condition is not serious, um, they don't consider themselves to be a risk for it, or the treatment is not seen as beneficial, they don't have the social support, a learned helplessness, adolescence is a factor, um, lack of continuity of care, and then the difficulty in treatment or the prevention. Those are all factors that increase your risk of noncompliance. This is my diabetic research shows that the test subjects are 98% more likely to take their diabetic pills if the pills are covered in chocolate. <laughs> so research into patient adherence has shown in a study with 2,500 patients that one third had inadequate health literacy. 42% misunderstood the directions given by their physician, 25% misunderstood their scheduling, and 60% were unable to read and understand informed consent. A lot of times we'll give them consent, tell them all the risks and benefits, but how much they understand is doubtful. Like recently in the NI, I had to get a consent for sedation for a reservoir, and I thought the mom was aware of there being a hydrocephalus and a ventricular hemorrhage, and I was only getting the sedation part, not the reservoir part. And I started with them telling the mom, I was like, you know how your baby has fluid around the brain? She was like, no. Nope. <laughs> so it was instead of a sedation console, it was everything from the beginning. So they don't understand every time. And she's been talked to many times, but they're not grasping it. And 56% um, of patients forget instructions that you gave them right after leaving the visit. So, but that does improve as they're familiar with the physician and their satisfaction with the visit improves, that retention of information also improves. <coughs> Patient involvement and participation in their care, trust, compassion, um, cultural awareness of the physician and the office staff all increase um, patient adherence. So the first steps to improve it, you have to have an accurate assessment of adherence if they're compliant or not. You have to know your patient's knowledge. You have to understand the regimen that you're prescribing and whether the patient believes in the regimen and if the patient understands it. And as adults, you have to know that there's always going to be a conflict. There's always a risk of conflict between your views and the patient's views, and that's fine. A healthy disagreement is good as long as you can find the, the middle ground where you, you can both agree at something that's better for the patient. And there is no single strategy that's going to improve adherence for all patients. Every patient is unique, so you have to tailor in interventions that are unique to each patient. So to monitor compliance, there's health status measures like hemoglobin A1C, 
Um, for anemia, you can check the CBC when they're coming back, if they're taking their iron pills. Biologic assays, you can check levels. We usually check like Kepra levels and you know levels of other medications that they take. Self-reports, you can ask the patient, how often are you taking it, how are you taking it. Um, pill counts, there's metered medications. Those are all um, ways that you can monitor compliance. So in pediatrics, compliance is related to the mom's perception of the severity of the child's illness. Um, also includes lack of continuity of care. That's something that's really important for us when we have our asthma patients, when we have our ADHD patients, our diabetics, seizures. Make sure we place them in a continuity clinic. It's so important that they see the same person every time that they can be held accountable for the things that they discuss rather than seeing a different person each time. And um, if they perceive there's no lack of support from the physician or there's lack of support from family, those are all decrease in compliance in, in kids. And then in asthma, we see this a lot where, you know, they'll have their maintenance therapy, they have their albuterol, and then they get through the winter and the kids are not wheezing anymore, they still stop the flow vent until next winter comes along and they have a crisis. They end up in the PICU or in the ER with, you know, severe asthma, they had stopped their flow vent and, or sometimes they make the albuterol into their maintenance therapy. They just give daily albuterol when it gets bad. So it's, um, that's something that comes in over long when just because there's no symptoms, they think the issue is resolved and they don't need to be taking the medication. Poor performance by the healthcare team often was found, found responsible for compliance. So again, chronic disease always requires that there's an ongoing partnership between the physician and the um, patient. There was a couple of models that was proposed for adherence and initially the first um, one is an authoritarian model which just takes the physician giving orders and the patient just follows the orders. And this was something that I saw when I did my PEDS rotation in Chicago. I rotated with a pediatrician who was in his 60s, he was Cuban, he was in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood and his patients were the, the parents that he treated as kids, they had kids and they brought them to him. And he was their go-to. There was no, there was no suggestion of a vaccine. There was no suggestion or conversation. It was like he said, "You're going to do this," and the patients just did it. There was no questioning. There was no arguing. There was compliance, and that was. And a, a huge part of that was the cultural. Um, and he could, they found comfortable with him. They grew up with him, so they took their kids to him. And he was one of those pediatricians I saw. They, he would give six vaccines all at once. He gave the vaccines himself. And there, no parents ever said no to the flu vaccine. It was never like, oh, are we going to get our shots today? No, it was always like, okay, I'm giving shots. And he just gave the shots. So that was, but in our time, not every practice works that way. So that brought about the health beliefs model, which more takes into the patient factors. And um, it takes into where the patient, how they see their illness, whether they believe the therapy to be effective or not. And then again, it was still found that they left out more factors. So the ecological model was proposed where it has contextual factors, individual factors, and process of care. So that includes your social support, your relationship with the physician, how complex the illness is. So all those together, all these factors play a role and you have to take it all as a whole in order to increase compliance. So in, in pediatrics, um, these are like some of the recommendations from a family medicine article about increasing compliance in peds. Um, when you can do once a day or BID dosing instead of this QID and TID. And for most of us, if you say, oh, twice a day, take it, it might mean you take it at 6, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., but that's not what it means to most patients. You can take it at 10 o'clock and take it at 12 o'clock again and it's twice a day. It doesn't mean there's the 12 hours in between. So you have to be specific with it. Take every day at 8 a.m. and every day at 8 p.m. would be more specific than BID or DID that doesn't mean much to the, the patients. And you need to simplify the regimen as much as possible. So if you can do once or twice daily, that increases it by 70%, the compliance. And um, if when you're giving medications to children, give the patient, parent and educational material also, that improves it and then use sweeteners, chocolate flavoring, or chocolate chasers to mask bitter medications to improve the child's willingness to take medication. Um, my baby was on Santac and Prilosec with reflux, and I found Santac tastes horrible. Could not get into her for anything. And then I found out Walgreens flavors everything. Whatever flavor you want, you just have to ask them. They'll put 
strawberry flavored, pineapple flavored, any flavor that you want, they can make that flavor and you can get medications to be flavored that way. And it is really hard to get a six month old <laughs> to take medication. So the compliance is understandable and that's why you need to talk to your parents, make sure that what you have in plan is working, if not come up with another plan. And then as a physician, you have to know what you're prescribing. You don't have to know the entire little packet that comes with the medication, but you need to know what the formulations are, what the common side effects are, and then if it needs to be stored specifically, and how it needs to be given, if it has to be taken with food, if it's a suspension that needs to be refrigerated. Pantoprazole, I learned, had to be refrigerated. It comes as a suspension, but you have to refrigerate it. Once again, like I said, we have a lot of patients that may not have a working refrigerator or you know, that's accessible easily, or they might live at the Providence House or in some group home that they can have that easy access. So we have to know the most common medications that we prescribe, know the major side effects, warn them about the side effects, how to deal with it, and um, what to expect as far as what formulation you're giving them. Compliance in the adolescence is something that we deal with every day. Um, Adherence is improved if the treatment is more immediate and there's serious complications versus if it's less obvious benefits and if it's intrusive to their lifestyle. So if they don't see a problem with having their blood pressure 160 over 90 daily, it's not affecting them. There's no point in them taking their medication. They're not seeing that effect. Versus if it's something that's hindering them from doing what they want, it's keeping them home, it's keeping them from their social activities or they have a headache every day that they want to get rid of, they're more likely to take that medication right then because they see the benefit. They feel it immediately. Adolescents are going through a stage of physical, pubertal, cognitive maturation. But they're still teenagers. They're self-centered. They feel like nothing is going to touch them. They're into that risk-taking, limit testing. So that's part of it that you have to understand. And having a chronic illness, whether it's diabetes or any infectious process, hypertension, asthma, it makes them feel powerless. <laughs> and to get that autonomy back, they do it by not taking their medications, missing their appointments, not following what you're doing. They're like, I'm in charge of my life. I can do what I want. And that's the way they act towards that. And also, with, it's, we've all been teenagers. It's a tough time. And for some, it's easier than others which you want to be accepted by your peers, the norm is what you want to be. You don't want to be outside the norm, and it's not normal to have a chronic illness. It's not normal to be giving yourself injections. It's not normal to be having an inhaler. So they want to be accepted by their friends, so they hide their illness, and they perceive the fall benefits from, false benefits from doing that. I mean, it means that they can still have a social life. They're not hindered from it. They're not feeling the side effects of the medication, so their decision is good for them. Right then and there, it works. So when you're dealing with an adolescent, you have to acknowledge their struggles. And then always when you come across non-compliance, that they're not caring in their illness, whatever their disease status is, their complications, you have to consider depression. If they need um, a psych referral, if they need counseling, if they need it, that's something to consider. You have to build a relationship that's non-judgmental. You have to be honest with them show concern, empathy, and respect for them and the parents. And we always say this, that interviewing the teenager alone is one of those big things that you have to do that gives them that autonomy, that shows them that you respect them as an individual. You see them able to make their own decisions. Um, and you can ask them for suggestions. So you'd be like, what can we do to help you get better? Or what can we do that will help you take this medicine more often? what do you think we should do so that you can apply this to your daily life? What makes us easier? And that gives them that control back. So other interventions, when you have a patient, a child that comes in, you have to know the key persons in their life. A lot of times we have grandparents bring in kids, but the mom or dad may be at work. You, have, you need to call them, see if you can get them on the phone, or see if they can come in at a later appointment if that's what it takes and talk to them, tell them what you're doing, tell them what the plan is, this is the medication, this is what I need to do, because whatever the grandparents relay probably is completely different from what you told them. I mean, they're not retaining it, they're passing it to a third person, it's been, by the end of the day, it's not what gets transferred, so you need to call them directly. If it takes a few minutes out of your time to call the mom or the dad and tell them this is what we need to do, or if the grandparent's the primary caretaker and the mom for once brings the kid, you have to tell them whoever the primary caretaker is. It, requires knowing your patient and their family structure, 
whatever their stress, stressors are, their support system is. Cultural and um, social factors affect therapy adherence, but interestingly enough, it was found that the physician doesn't have to be of the same background as the patient. That does not improve um, compliance. You just have to be understanding and leave the bias alone and get to know your patient, meet, understand what their needs are. You also have to improve your accessibility of the site. Some of it is beyond our control when we go out and you have your own practices. You can decrease wait times. You can improve the continuity of care. Make sure your patients always see you or you know your continuity patients. Keep that continuity going. Put them in a continuity clinic. If they fall out of a continuity clinic and happen to come in a general clinic, put them back in a continuity clinic. Changing hours of the care in a private practice where if you are doing eight to four, maybe you can do nine to five to get in that parents that get out at four and can bring the child in. Understanding the patient's priority in the illness is a big factor. For a kid, improving their lung function might not be their goal, but getting to play basketball or run track might be their goal. So you have to understand that goal and say, let's try to get this done. If we can do this and this, then by next season, you should be able to play. You know, we can so work towards that goal and understand, talk to them and their priority, not just in numbers and getting that in. In communication is a huge factor. You have to ask questions like does keep asking questions like does this make sense to you? Is there something else or something more that we need to talk about? A lot of times we give all the anticipatory guidance and we give, do all the talking. We're not we spend less time listening or we hurry through and the patients might have more to say. So give them that opportunity. And then have a post plan formulation where you ask them, do you think you can carry out this plan? Do you think you'll be able to do this? Does this make sense to you? And again, understanding what the parent wants out of it, what the child wants out of it can boost the motivation. It's a really good quote I like by John Dunn. If you've never read Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions, you should. It's a really good work of medicine and literature. But it's, I observe the physician with the same diligence as he the disease. I see that he fears and I fear with him. When you have a lack of confidence, when you have a bias, your patients see that. Regardless of what their education level might be, whatever it is, they can perceive what you see. So if you are not confident in what you're telling them, they're not going to be confident in doing it. So they see what you feel, and you need to put that forward, and you need to be the supportive. You need to be the first source of support for them. Understanding the barriers of treatment is important. You have to know what the cost and difficulty of implementing the plan that you're proposing is, such as if you give them a medication, can this be carried out in their school? Will the school allow them to follow this diet? Will they give them the breaks to take this medication three times a day if that's the only way it needs to be done? What you need to do to make it happen? And then does your parent, patients have the skill, the motivation, um, the developmental level to carry out this plan? Information is crucial, the information that you provide. There is always a discrepancy between what is told and what is understood. Um, only 50% of the information is retained immediately after a visit and 25% 30 minutes after. So everything that you tell them needs to be written down. It doesn't need to be paragraphs on paragraphs, but short bullet points, you know, write down your main instructions. Um, Audiovisual aids and computer games can be used. This is really good in PEDS. Um, if you have if you're telling, teaching them how to take injections, insulin, whatever, if they see, if they learn the technique by seeing an adolescent giving themselves insulin shot, that is more receptible than in you, watching an adult do it or being taught by you to do it. If they can watch there and there's videos available or if you, they see a kid doing their inhaler, that makes them easier to relate to that. And then you have to keep repeating the training and techniques. Um, we provide spacer education the first time we give spacer. And a lot of times a year later, the next season comes around, their spacer are gone. They're like, oh, I know how to use it. Just give me the spacer. Repeat that spacer education. It helps to reinforce that. And the kids are growing up. So where mom was doing it, the next time around, the kid might be getting more into it. So teach them the techniques. Repeat the training every chance you get. Make sure you reinforce that. And medical information by itself may not be enough. There was a study done with social learning group versus medical fact groups where one group was given all the information, told how to do it, what needs to be done, versus a social learning group that was taught how to deal with the social situation. Like um, in a diabetic, if you're at a friend's sleepover, 
what do you do when that comes up? How do you give yourself a shot without making that socially awkward? And it was found that the social learning group did way better than having all the medical facts. So preparing them for challenges that they can, that comes up in their daily lives helps them more than just giving them the facts. What can you do when you face this? You know, how do you, if you're at a fast food restaurant but you're on this strict diet, you know, what do you need to do? How are we going to target that? So having a plan together, coming up with problem solving helps more than just giving facts. Behavior changes that you can do, simplify the regimen. Like we said, do combination drugs when possible. Decrease the frequency of it. Try to reduce the cost. Know your side effect profile and avoid those with the significant side effects. Prioritize treatments. You know, a lot of times our asthmatics are on like Flovind, Albuterol, Singular, Zyrtec, you know, Flonase, they have, and then on top of that, there are other medications. Prioritize, this is what we need to do. If you do nothing else, do this first. You know, take your Flovin daily, and then the Albuterol is a rescue therapy. And then if you take your Singular all the time, that can help. So let them know what is most important, that if they're not gonna do anything else, this is the one that they need to do. And again, complex techniques do need to be demonstrated rather than just verbalized. Um, minimize changes to usual patterns, like the timing cues. If you can have something that follows their daily schedules, like you take this with breakfast, take it with lunch, and take it with dinner, that's easier than random times of the day where they have to remember to take it. You know, when you, have, when you can associate it with something that's already a part of their daily lives, that makes it easier. Um, you can do... Um, pill recording and pill boxes that keeps count of it, that reminds them. And then again, teach them problem solving strategies on how to encounter them. Follow up is really crucial. Adequate follow up is a big, fact, a big factor for um, improving compliance. After you come up with the therapy plan or after you're proposing a new plan, follow up. Call them a couple of days later and then see how they're doing, if they're still sticking with it, and then reinforce the compliant behavior. Like day four out of 10 of a course of therapy, call them, see how they're doing, and then say, you're doing great, you just need to do this for six more days, and then the therapy will be completed. You might be feeling a little better, but that doesn't mean we stop the medication. You know, we don't wanna have it come back or increase the resistance. We don't wanna have to go through us and go to a stronger antibiotics next time. So just finish it, keep doing it. Having that call in the middle was shown to increase compliance and help them complete that therapy. And then if you do that follow-up right in the middle, if you take that two minutes to make a call and check on the patient and see how they're doing, you can also identify the barriers that come up and that can be modified there than waiting till your next visit or they might not be coming to the next visit. Like if the parents tell you, no, every time I gave it to them, they spit up. And you can realize right then, okay, I need to come up with something else, some other formulation than this because it's not working. <coughs> and then also you can change your patient view on what their condition is and treatment is like right then and address it rather than prolonging it and having more complications come up. There was a article in the Family Medicine Journal about how physicians can take tips from the business world from salespeople and implement that to increase compliance. And it was this five steps that you give. And I always think of like a car salesperson and it does make sense. You have to establish a sense of trust, and it was told that the study found that the amygdala filters information and attaches an emotional context to it. So when you feel like someone is manipulating you, selling you information, it doesn't go to your prefrontal context. You just shut it down. Whatever they say after that, it doesn't matter because you stopped processing it. You're not going to receive it. You saw it as a threat. You're not going to follow that plan. In the same way, you have to establish that trust. You have to find the little details in your patients' lives and cue into that and talk to them, get to know them. A good salesperson always finds those little things. <laughs> They'll know who to talk to. If you have kids, they know to say, oh, this is the car that's safest for kids. You know, they find the little details, they get to know you before rather than just trying to come off strongly and sell it. It's, it works that then when you have to <laughs> get your patient better. You have to earn their trust and you have to know their actual needs so you have to keep asking them what they, a lot of times we find out what the chief complaint is not at all their chief complaint. What's listed on that nursing note is not what they, if you, the more you inquire, there's other things that come up and that might be their priority and that's what they want to deal with that day. And think dialogue, not monologue, rather than you just talking at them, give them the opportunity to tell their story, what they want of it. And if it was found that 
there are some patients that will take up all your time, but most patients, if you give them the time to talk to you, they will t finish talking in five minutes, tell you everything that they need to tell you, and then they felt that they were heard, they were listened to, and then you can talk, and you can tell them what your suggestion is. And then it was also, you know, don't force the close. You have to try it out first and do a test close. You know, if we can do this twice a day, or if we can try to do 15 minutes of exercise every day, would that be something that works for you? And see how they respond to that, rather than saying, hey, this is what we're gonna do. You need to just follow these directions. Try it, see how they receive that, how they respond to it. If they're like, yeah, I can do that. Then we're like, okay, let's try it and see how you do with it. And then again, always follow up, see how the plan is working. See, we talked about this, how are you doing? Are you able to carry this out? There's an app for everything. So there's a tool to improve <laughs> compliance. So smartphone apps are always there. I don't know why our kids and teenagers and parents that are always on the phone, they can't even pay attention, won't find apps to remind them to take their pills. Um, there are text and email notifications that can pop up and tell you. You need to do your inhaler or you need to take your medicine. Um, there's also remote monitoring devices, patient portals, smart pills. <coughs> These are some of the apps that I found that iPhone and Samsung has. Um, pill reminder is one that's really popular that can put all your pills in order and tell you when to take it. Um, Rx, my new prescription, tells you when to pick up your prescriptions when you're out, which prescription you need to take when. Everybody has a smartphone, <laughs> regardless. So, um, these are some examples of electronic devices that is out, that's high tech, that can be used like a medication alert watch that vibrates and tells you to take your pills. Um, smart pill container, where the container itself will count for you. Those are all, there's more and more technologies. This was something that I found interesting, that there are games for pediatric patients, and many of these were um, started as part of like leukemia and lymphoma, like for cancer patients. Um, and these are really, really good ones. I went to several of them, and I can see the blood test one is really good. It's very good animated, and it tells you when you're preparing for a blood test, like what the components of the blood, what the tests mean, what the effect is. Starlight Games is one that's really good and has one for asthma. I was trying to play the asthma one. <laughs> Got a little distracted. But those, there are games out there that um, the kids will learn more about their disease process and that they will find interesting. And they're fun games. So not, it doesn't feel like you're teaching them anything. They, there's a purpose. There's an end to the game. So those are all, there's some suggestions and there's more and more that's in the works. But a lot of these are for cancer patients, oncology. So to conclude, I didn't come up with this. <laughs> the simple plan is for compliance. It stands for simplifying the regimen, imparting the knowledge, modifying your patient's belief in adhering to that, providing communication, trust. You have to leave the bias and you have to evaluate the adherence. The most important thing is to build trust and then maintain the relationship and communicate effectively with your patients. As pediatricians, we play such a crucial role in that our kids who we teach compliance to is our adults that go out into the adult world. And if they have learned these skills now, they know how to d deal with their diseases. You know, it's kind of like Dr. Ball was talking about with transition. We're helping them transition. We're helping them be more compliant and decrease the complications of their long-term illness. So we have them first. So we need to do what we can with their disease. And we're the ones that usually diagnose them in the beginning whether it's a sickle cell, asthma, diabetes, whatever. So if we can do whatever we can to increase their compliance, that helps them in the long run as we transition into adult care. Even if that much time is not focused then, they've already learned the skills to deal with it and that helps them. That's my non-compliant child. <laughs> Questions? I think, I think your presentation really showed us that although it's easy to blame the patients when there's non-compliance, that we play a really important mm -hmm. and incredibly important role in, in developing that therapeutic relationship that allows the patient to be successful in managing either acute or chronic illness. And so this is a really important presentation. So thank you. Um, questions? Elaine. Does um, Walgreens flavor it for free, like the medicines? Or I think it's two to four dollars. Okay. Yeah.
decided to pay my for labor to for you or how much it costs. Yeah. I don't know if Medicaid covers that, but LSU insurance, it's $4. <laughs> but, um, I think it's free now in pharmacy. Is it? In our pharmacy? Uh, in yeah. Pharmacy. Kelsey does say we can do yeah, it. I yeah. wanted to make some comments. Um, I think it's a very important presentation and something that we need to do as pediatricians every time. Um, some things you can also do, like just don't underuse the other staff that you have, like a social worker. Mm -hmm. If you, especially if you have a kid that's been in a hospital for a week, ten days, and they get a normal prescription, you can't just hand them the prescription that day and go, like, go take your meds at home. You need mm -hmm. to anticipate. You need to know your patient's probably going to go home and antibiotics. You should involve your social worker. You should be talking to those parents to see what are the needs. Who's going to be giving those medications? And what I did with my team on the floor, we would anticipate kids that needed to go home, and we would send the prescriptions to the pharmacy and have the parents pick it up before discharging, come back to the hospital, mm -hmm. and show us and make sure they actually know how to use it. And Kelsey is really good if you talk to her. She can actually draw a chart for your patient on what time mm -hmm. they're supposed to take their medication. So there's so much resources that we have. So don't underutilize utilize your resources. Talk to your social worker, talk to your pharmacist, and you can always come up with things to kind of help the patient. And also patients that go on temporary doses. One thing I found that kind of helps yeah, sometimes yeah. I don't just prescribe it and tell them to do this. So I individualize the prescription. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're doing the, let's say, temporary, you're doing 10 milligram per kilogram for two weeks, I give them a prescription for 10 milligram per kilogram for two weeks, and then maybe we're increasing to 20, then I give them a separate prescription and put a separate date. I call the pharmacy, talk to them, this is the plan, this is why we're doing this, and send it in. So the parent just goes and picks it up at the end of one, and that kind of minimizes sometimes the confusion. Because sometimes you have patients on steroids for a long time, and didn't realize it was supposed to take So this is some of the things you can just make sure the needs of your patient and kind of work towards that now. And even if you're not the one that started them on the medication, if neurology or whoever shot them, but they come to you and you found they're not compliant, you can make a calendar. You can make a calendar and be like, from this date to this date, we're on this dose. And then the next, having a visual aid also helps them. So you are the primary care. You can't blame it on the specialty. You need to have, that's why it's important for all chronic illnesses to have that primary care, and you need to take that responsibility. Take the advice from the specialties of what their plan is, and then try to make it easier for your patient to be compliant. I think the other thing that's very important, most of your non-compliant patients are non-compliant because your goals and their goals are completely different. Yeah. And you talked about that. I mean, mm -hmm. find out what they want. What do they expect? You want them to not have a stroke when they're 30. Right. Your parents want them to get through this grade that they have. You know, mm -hmm. It's completely different. Right. I was going to say, the uh, great presentation, by the way. Um, I think one of the biggest things I've learned in residency is to, you know, doctors are great at giving advice and telling patients what to do, but to truly understand the financial burden that we ask mm -hmm. our patients of, um, it's definitely more in the adult world, you know, for the adults, it's really knowing what's on the form on the list. You know, when I prescribe them before, I do hypertensive. Do I know how much they cost? And I'm asking them how much they spend them on. But even with the children, you know, we ask them all the, you know, the obese kids and stuff. Hey, you know, we give them a great diet and they can do it for six months in the way, but can they afford that diet? You know, so I think it's important as primary care providers to truly understand the financial burden. And don't be afraid to have a conversation in the office. I do it with almost all my patients. Mm -hmm. you know, I go for coupons for them on good RX and just um, you know, ask them like, whatever you're asking them to do, whether it's medications, diet, any lifestyle modifications, just you know, ask them, can you afford to do this? Because if they can't, then you haven't done any like you haven't done any impact. So and you can change your plan. So I think that. We truly understand the financial burden, especially with this population that we take care of. We can have more impact on medicine. It really, really makes a big deal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can always tell them with your new therapy, you'd be like, if for some reason this cannot be built, built call me or yeah. have pharmacy call me. We can find out something that does work. Mm -hmm. Just have them call because we go months without knowing that they never yeah. take it. And our patients do miss follow up, so we never know whether they took it or not. So that's important. Dr. Gungor. Thank you for the nice presentation. I also want to stress it is so important for us to give our patients and families some positive feedback and mm -hmm. some praise. Those of you who rotated us in uh, diabetes clinics, uh, we sometimes see patients, they come, they have not been checking any blood sugars, hardly one blood sugar a day, not taking insulin, but they come to clinic, right? They are there and mm -hmm. mom or dad has taken off. So those are a few things that we can praise them for. We can say thank you for being here today. You know, just some positivity. And then uh, usually at the end of the visit, I will ask them, so 
at the end of this, could you set a couple of goals for yourself? What can you change? And some will be really verbal about that, and they will say, mm, I can do this better, do that. Some, we need to work a little more, but we try every day, uh, and thank you. Dr. Farrell. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, for those patients where you're really, the chronic patients that you're very concerned about that they're not taking their medication and perhaps it's bordering on neglect, the Medicaid database is a pretty good way of screening to see if they're picking their medications up. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you'll find, we had one this week where they, with chronic disease that was picking up their penicillin twice last year. That's a different ball game than the one that's picking it up every month and maybe missing doses and stuff that you can work with. So it's an easy thing to do. Your, um, Ms. Shirley probably has access to it. My clerk has access to it. And it's pretty accurate mm -hmm. as far as I've found when I've compared it with pharmacy data. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. No other questions or comments. Jesse, thank you again. Thank you.